I'm really pleased to welcome our first speaker, uh, Professor Mike Searle from the um, Department of Earth Sciences, who I think it's fair to say is a Renaissance man. Um, I think, really, Mike should be a geographer, so I'm actually going to try and capture him and, and keep him in the department. He's probably been on more uh, expeditions and exploratory travel than, than most geographers. Um, he's worked for um, 30 years or more in the Karakoram, uh, Burma, Oman, all sorts of really interesting places around the world. Um, and he is an extreme expert on, on many of these uh, things and is also a very popular author, uh, having written uh, extremely uh, good things and very good books on all aspects of geology. Is that enough of a big build-up? Uh, you can carry on if you want. Okay, no, 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 I think I've, I've almost run out of things to say, except of course he's a fellow of Worcester College, which means, like me, he's a survivor of the wackiest college uh, in Oxford. So, yeah. please, Mike, tell us a bit more okay. about Oman and Geopark. Good, well, thank you very much, Heather, that was great. Okay, um, I'm gonna admit this talk is going to be a bit unusual because I'm mixing quite a bit of different stuff, geography, geology, politics, environmental, conservation, all sorts of things. So forgive me if I sort of ramble on at tangents. And I've got an awful lot of slides. So. This, this whole idea of setting up a whole series of geoparks in Oman really came about about 10 years ago when I was leading a field trip across the UAE part of the mountains. and. Uh, went to these outcrops here where I had a uh, student working and uh, it's actually a series of granite dikes. If any of you know anything about the geology of the Himalayas, continental collision, big crustal thickening, metamorphic rocks, granite, everything that you would not expect to see in Oman. So I also work in the Himalayas. I was very used to seeing these granite dikes. They have big garnets, tourmalines, cordierite, all sorts of beautiful minerals in and it's intruding rocks that came from the mantle. These dark rocks here are rocks that originated from way down in the oceanic mantle beneath the Moho discontinuity. So this outcrop here, all around this beach, is literally unique in the world. There is nowhere else in the planet that you see these Himalayan type granites intruding mantle oceanic rocks. And uh, we'd been working here for a couple of years, luckily, uh, collected a lot of samples and uh, my student right up finished up and then the following year I took a field trip here and the whole place was fenced off they'd concreted over the whole of this outcrop and built a palace for Sheikh Mohammed of Dubai and that was it all of this is now completely covered there's a beautiful palace here all of this is concreted over and it's all fenced off nobody can go there and I suddenly thought wow well that outcrop is gone forever unless we blow up Sheikh Mohammed's <laughs> palace, which is not a very good thing to do in UAE. And it suddenly struck me that it, there's actually a hell of a lot of sites right through the Omar Mountains which are in imminent danger of being destroyed simply because people, the developers, the owners, did not know what was there geologically. So the whole story sort of goes back. I was brought up in Oman. Uh, my dad, this person, was finance manager of Shell out there, PDO. In the early 70s, we were out there on school holidays. I was a teenager then when Sultan Qaboos uh, had a coup in Salala and his, his father was shot in the leg and transported back to live in the Dorchester Hotel in London. He took power in July, a baking hot summer, so most of the diplomats and expatriates were out of the country. And uh, the whole country changed absolutely dramatically from that day on. In 1970, Oman was probably the least developed country anywhere in the world. It had no roads at all, a few tarmac concrete roads in Mutra. It had no school, no hospital, one missionary hospital in Mutra. This was the international airport at Azeba, which is a dirt strip. These Dakotas used to fly in from Dubai. And this is how I remember the country when we first, when I was a teenager and we first lived out there. And it was an absolutely fabulous place. It was like going back to the Middle Ages. The people were absolutely delightful. Uh, this is the old gates of Muscat, uh, completely surrounded by mountains. Uh, Muscat Harbour, which has to be one of the most beautiful capital cities in the world. This is in 1970, dominated by these two uh, old Portuguese forts of Jalali and Mirani. The British Embassy down here on the seafront. Absolutely fantastic place. It was 
just wonderful. Every aspect of it was great. Um, and then uh, here's another picture of the, uh, the Muscat seafront. All of this is gone now. There's a huge new palace, Sultan's Palace here. The British Embassy was bulldozed. This wonderful old house and now lives in a sort of modern monstrosity around the coast. Uh, further along, if anyone knows Oman, I know several people here do. This is taken from where the Gulf Hope Crown Plaza is now, looking along Kurum Beach. And uh, this is now completely covered with housing estates and uh, hotels, five-star hotels and everything. But when I was there as a schoolboy in the 70s, we used to run along the beach and it was just a, a fantastic place to live. This is the Shell Camp at Ras Al Hamra. Uh, this is now, of course, uh, highly developed. This is the main uh, clubhouse beach where the all company people work. Uh, this is further along the coast from Oman. There's now a five-star hotel here, the Al Bustan. And in the old days, um, I started my PhD in Oman. Uh, and this is my Land Rover that I used for three years to travel all over the country. Inland, in the interior, it was still full of these wonderful mud brick villages. There's not a con corrugated iron roof to be seen there. This is at Izki, the end of the Samail Gap. And uh, the whole of the interior was like that. Absolutely wonderful place. And then rapid developments. As soon as Kabus took over in 1970, everyone jumped in there. It was the last great gold rush of developments and exploration for oil and gas. Uh, and as a result of this field trip in the UAE, I decided, okay, better make a list of all these geological sites that need to be preserved. So I did, and I wrote a paper that was published with 50 sites laid out with maps, GPS, what was important, why we need to preserve them, and uh, gave this to everyone I could think of who had any sort of influence with the government or the oil companies or whatever. And it sort of languished there. Every time I gave a talk, everyone said, oh, great thing to do. Yes, definitely full agreement. And I could never get it off the ground at all. Um, so to cut a long story short, uh, with the help of Bruce Lavelle, who's sitting here, who was the ex-exploration manager of PDO, PDO, Shell, we managed to get PDO to fund this. So we now have funds to set this up. And this was a couple of years ago, and it's in the process now, hopefully, of getting set up so that these sites will be preserved from overdevelopment or any sort of development. Some of them fenced off, some of them left exactly as they are. They're all different. So here is a list of, this is just my personal list of the 50 greatest sites, geological sites in Oman. I won't go through all of them. But there are at least three. If you look at the UNESCO World Heritage Sites, which are the world's most spectacular places that we need to preserve, there's at least three sites in Oman that are well easily into that category. The first one is the Ophiolite. Oman is known geologically for having the world's biggest and best Ophiolite sequence, which is a slab of oceanic crust and upper mantle, normally sits in the oceans, but as now this whole slab has been abducted and placed onto the continental margin in Oman. And it has this spectacular geomorphology. Anyone who's been to Oman, this is very unique geomorphology for the Oman. But this, these are all mantle rocks, olivine pyroxene hartsbergite. Um, so clearly this, geologically, this is by far the most famous aspect of the Oman mountains. Of course, the second one is the Jebel Akhtar, which is the huge range of mountains that make up the spine of the Oman mountains in the central part. And Jebel Akhtar, this is a picture taken from the summit looking east at sunrise. And all of these mountains here is the complete Mesozoic section through the Arabian Shelf. Now, two thirds of the world's oil comes in the Tethian regions from uh, all the way from uh, Turkey, Iran, through the Persian Gulf, Kuwait, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, they're all tied up with rocks that are exposed around here. And everywhere in the Persian Gulf, the Saudi Arabia, they're all buried. So you drill through them to get to the rock. In Oman, there's about a dozen wadis. Oops, sorry. There's a dozen wadis that uh, drain, cut right through these mountains where you can see the rocks all laid out strata by strata. 
So it is incredibly important for the oil and gas industry. This has been worked on to millimeter scale, incredible uh, detail by all companies over the years. But it's also a spectacularly beautiful place. I'll show you a few pictures from Jebel Akhtar. The third site is up on the far northern peninsula, the Musandam. And this is an absolutely unique geographical place. If any of you see a Landsat photograph of the Persian Gulf, it's all pretty flat, sea, desert. In Musandam, you have nearly two and a half thousand meter mountains falling pretty much directly into the sea. The whole peninsula has been tilted east, so you have these amazing fjords that cut in from the Persian, from the Gulf of Oman and the northern Gulf, and it's only 25 kilometers across to Iran from here. When I was mapping this, uh, it was the time that uh, Khomeini was threatening to block the, Gulf, the Persian Gulf from Bandar Abbas, so all the Iranian Navy ships were anchored around offshore, and I was hiking around here doing my structural geology. So this is what the Omar Mountains look like, and this is a picture taken from an aeroplane uh, looking across at one section of the Ophiolite. The main Samal Gap is the main road that runs from Muscat to the interior. These are all the shelf carbonate mountains of Jebel Akhtar, and you can see the level of exposure. If you're a geologist, this is absolute paradise. You can walk. This is the crust mantle boundary, the Mogorovicic discontinuity, which is the most famous geophysical line on the planet. And it's a geophysical line, you can't see it. So you shoot seismic waves and waves bounce off the moho. In Oman, you can walk along it, you can map it out. It's absolutely phenomenal. It has the, the most spectacular array. There's anything up to 10, 15 kilometers of thickness of mantle sequence rocks there that are unique. They should be at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, Pacific, Indian Oceans, but they're sitting here on top of Arabia. And then the lower crust, the Gabros here. So in Oman, we have a complete section of nearly 20 kilometer thickness of mantle, moho transition zone, and crust that make up the entire Tethian Ocean crust. And this is completely unique in the world. So it's incredibly important for geologists, for oceanographers, for geophysicists, and anyone interested in how the Earth works, plate tectonics. Um, so here's a cartoon picture of one model of how ophiolites are formed. These are obducted sheets of ocean crust and mantle called ophiolites. And they are characterized like two thirds of the world is made up of ocean today. And they're all pretty much the same structure. They all have deep sea sediments on top, pillow lavas followed by sheeted dikes, lower crustal gabbros, the moho, and then these are the mantle peridotites at the base. Here's another model. There's a lot of discussion whether it was formed in a mid-ocean ridge type model or above a subduction zone. Uh, this is definitively correct model, <laughs> <laughs> which I won't go into now. Okay, so that's one. The, the Sumail Ophiolite, world-class section through the oceanic crust and upper mantle, that has to be a UNESCO World Heritage Site without a shadow of doubt. The other one is the Jebel Akhtar. Jebel Akhtar is the core region, the central part of the mountain belt, and it's composed of the complete section of Permian. Throughout the Mesozoic, there's 180 million years of shelf carbonate history tied up in these rocks, and including a lot of the reservoirs. This one up here is the main hydrocarbon reservoir for the whole of the Saudi Arabia, Persian Gulf, UAE, Oman, section. Something like half the world's oil comes from this reservoir, right throughout the whole of the Middle East. Uh, there's other reservoirs down here in the Triassic, Jurassic, further down. This is just one wadi. This is the Grand Canyon of Oman, but there's a dozen wadis like this that drain Jebel Akhtar in all directions. There's now trekking routes up here. This is a village. This is quite a sizable little date palm village up here, and there's trekking routes that you can climb up here. So it's spectacular climbing, trekking country. Uh, this is what Jebel Akhtar looks like from a long way up. The highest mountain, Jebel Shams, is 3,000 meters. And all of this ridge is above 2,500 meters. The cliffs there are two kilometers plus straight down. So it's phenomenal for climbing, trekking, exploration, geology, everything. Wonderful place. Um, here's one section of the cliff from Jebel Shams, which is up here at the top, 
right down through the Permian. This is the pre-Permian formations that make up the core of the window. This is the major unconformity that's present everywhere across the radii. And then you've had 150 odd million years of stable carbonate sedimentation throughout. Well, in the 70s, when we first uh, were living out there, it was completely closed country up until Sultan Qaboos took over. And then from 1971, you, you were free to travel. So the first thing we did was buy a Land Rover and out every weekend hiking around the mountains. And in those days, the villages were just beautiful. Uh, sorry, I'm going wrong way here. The villages were, uh, this is a village called Sharia, which is on the Saik Plateau. Very famous during the Jebel War, when the Brits, the SAS, went in to fight off the Imam at uh, Tanuf. And uh, basically that's what turned the Omar Mountains towards the Sultan, rather than to this religious leader in, based in Islam. And the SAS used to do a lot of trips around here. But in those days, uh, we were literally the first um, Europeans to climb up to a lot of these villages and meet some of these locals. And they, all these fields were terraced, they're growing alfalfa, and this is cherry blossom, almond blossom, absolutely beautiful place. And the Jebel Akhtar region was full of these villages, everywhere you would go. Nowadays, these fields are all left, but nobody cultivates them anymore, a lot of them are turned to rack and ruin. Some of these villages are completely empty now. In those days, they were very, people living there all the time. Nobody really had jobs in those days. Um, and a lot of other places around. This is the famous Snake Gorge, Wadi Bani Alf. This is one of the world's great canyoning routes, which we were the first people to descend this in the uh, late 70s, bolting, abseiling down waterfalls, swim, abseil, swim. Absolutely spectacular. And it's about a five mile canyoning route from here down this gorge all the way down, down there. You just got to be careful you're not there when it starts raining because it does fill up pretty quickly. So in the central part of Jebel Akhtar, there's all sorts of uh, geologically famous rock outcrops here that are scattered around. Particularly, I'm sure you've all heard of Snowball Earth uh, during the late Precambrian when the whole Earth temperatures were cold enough that the whole Earth was under snow and ice. Some of the best Snowball Earth outcrops are actually in Wadi Mustal and some of these wadis in the interior here and right around the margins is the famous Permian Unconformity. Uh, more spectacular, this is, you know, there's a dozen wadis that drain off Jebel Akhtar and they're all this sort of scale of grandeur and there's a little tiny village here, you see those houses? That's a spectacular place to live in. Um, and we were absolutely amazed when we hiked up here, found a route through these cliffs, walking around and, oh my god, somebody's living there. And they actually had a little baby who was in this house that was tied with his ankle to a big rock. And the string went right to the cliff edge. So this baby was crawling around. And the parents went off, you know, herding goats and stuff. No problem. Uh, so, um, and here, this is one of the great uh, wonders of the Jebel Akhtar, the Grand Canyon range of all, with a freestanding rock pinnacle up here that still hasn't been climbed. So we've done quite a bit of climbing around here and still never managed to make it up to that. Uh, geologically, of course, absolutely amazing structures. Uh, this is one of the big folds. This is the nose of Jebel Akhtar. Uh, right around a hidden, this is the far western end of the Jebel Akhtar range. Um, so that Jebel Akhtar is down here. The third World Heritage Site is the Musandan Peninsula up here in the north. Uh, this is Iran, Bandar Abbas is up there, Kishan Island is big salt domes up here, and this is where all the Zagros folds and thrusts meet the Oman uh, Musandan folds and thrusts. So geologically, it's actually the very first point where the two continents of Arabia, central Iran collided. And what we're seeing in Musandan, the structures, are the very initial phases of the two continent collision. So the late stages you see in the Himalayas, intermediate stages you see in the Zagros, but here you see the very early stages. In further south in Oman, it hasn't yet collided, so we still, that's why the Ophiolite is so beautifully preserved. So here's just a quick cross-section through the Permian, 
Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous rocks with these great big thrust faults that are exposed in Russellheimer, Haggold window, is you see this doubling up of the entire basement to Cretaceous section in the ha Woody Haggle in Russellheimer. Absolutely spectacular place. And if anywhere should be preserved in Russellheimer, it's the Haggle window. Uh, this is down in the Diller Zone. All of this Diller Zone is actually, the whole lot has been built over. In the old days, we used to camp around here. There's now nowhere to pitch a tent. There's motorways going everywhere, housing estates everywhere. And the development in the UAE is quite absolutely mind-blowing. Uh, the Musandam, of course, luckily, it's so mountainous that most of it can't be developed. This is a little village called Kunzal, which is right in the northern tip of uh, Musandam. It's 25 kilometers across the Straits of Hormuz to Iran. And these villages, that village is, um, they speak their own language up here. It's not really Arabic. It's this form of Farsi, which is Persian. So the idea, and this is completely cut off, not only from the Hassab and the rest of the Sandan, but from Oman. There's now a ferry that goes once a week from Muscat up to uh, Dibba. But um, to get up here, you have to brave the huge waves that come out of the uh, Persian Gulf and the Straits of Hormuz. This is what the Musandam Mountains look like from the sea. And one of the most incredible things about Musandam is that it's one of the breeding centers for the whale shark, which is the world's biggest fish. Uh, it has incredible stuff there as well. Sailfish, sawfish, all these big, big pelagic ocean-going fish. And they all come around here uh, to breed in the summer. These are sawfish, which are absolutely stunning animals. Um, manta rays, dolphins. Every time I've been out in the Dower, up from Casa, you see these, well not these, but you see dolphins all the time. And most dives you see these things. So, uh, wonderful place. And we've spent quite a lot of time doing geology and geophysics and surveying up there. And when I first mapped this in uh, straight after my PhD in the early 80s. Um, I was hiking up all around here, and these are the Shehu villages of the tribe that live up in the Sandan. And they were, had a reputation for being very fearsome. They carry these little axes with them for hurling at goats and stray geologists and people like that. And they said, uh, what are you doing here? You know, no idea, what are you doing? I said, I'm looking at the rocks. And they said, there's no oil here. The oil's all in the sea down there. Go away. <laughs> Um, so the Shahu no longer live in the mountains. They've all gone down to Russell Kaima, Umal Kawain, and they're probably uh, on building sites in UAE nowadays. So I'm going to run through just a few brief um, slides of some of the key geo parks that we'd like to protect in Oman. And this is the first oil discovery in Oman, or could have been actually. Fahud 1 is this well that was called the unluckiest, most ill-fated wildcat well in the history of the Middle East because they drilled it. Fantastic story about all the exploration of Fahud, which I don't have time to get into. But they drilled this, and um, it missed the pay zone by a couple of hundred meters, if that. And then half of the great conglomerate that had been brought together, including Shell, BP, Partex, Gulbenkian, Half of them left after this saying, there's no oil in Oman, we're out. And Shell were the biggest stakeholders left, so they ended up taking over most of the concession for Oman. And several years later, drilled uh, Fahud 2, which is this guy here, straight into one of the big oil fields, which is all sitting in this great big anticline axis in Oman. It's a fantastic story. And historically, there's a picture of one of the old uh, geologists, Peter Wormsley, I think, standing in exactly the same place I'm standing, looking down at Fahud 1. So this has huge historic importance for Oman and the oil industry, and that should be preserved. There's a number of fossil sites all around Oman that are absolutely stunning. I don't, I'm not a paleontologist, but I do know a little bit about fossils. These are all rudis, which are solitary corals that died out at KT boundary 65 million years ago. And this whole mountain is comprised of these things. And they're just lying in this perfectly preserved reef, Cretaceous reef, immediately at the KT boundary 65 million years ago. 
It's right out in the desert. It's a very, you need four wheel drive, plenty of water and fuel, and good GPS to get there. Um, but there are now collectors from museums coming down here taking this stuff away by the truck for So something needs to be done about this. But it is one of the world's most stunning paleontological sites. This whole mountain full of rudest corals everywhere you look. So the Omanis have actually done a very good job when it comes to preserving their cultural heritage. There's forts all over Oman, everywhere in, oh, I think I'm standing in the way of that thing. Uh, yeah, there's for every big village town has a fort like this. This is the old fort of Bakla, which was in a state of incredible disrepair. Every time it rained, which is not that often, it just dripped and it fell apart. So they really spent a lot of money trying to preserve it. And a lot of it is now preserved in a very, very good way. It's modern, it's preserved, but it's done in the old style. They have the old, uh, all the, the experts coming in from, I think, Italy mostly, the reconstruction builders, and uh, they do things in a very good way. Uh, but that's when it comes to the cultural heritage. Now, I'm going to do a bit of a change of tack here. And what can we learn from its next door neighbor, the United Arab Emirates? I don't know if any of you have been to Dubai. In uh, 1985, Dubai was desert. There was almost nothing there. A couple of banks on the creek, and that was it. There's no oil in Dubai, so it's all banking. And they have made an unbelievable job at making money. How? I have absolutely no idea. But in 2005, this main Sheikh Zayed road that goes west out of Dubai towards Abu Dhabi, now it looks like that. And this has all grown out of the desert. You know, this has all happened in 50 years. It's gone from nothing, desert, to this. And it's quite mind boggling, actually. I mean, I still can't get my head around how awful Dubai is. <laughs> you know, for a naturalist, for a geologist, for a conservationist like me, this is the epitome of hell. There's nothing <laughs> old left. There's nothing of the natural world left. It's an awful place. If you like gambling or shopping, then fine. I don't do either of those. Uh, and they've gone ballistically mad. These people that were Bedouin, you know, Sheikh Mohammed's father was Sheikh Zayed, used to go falconing with Thesiger back in the, you know, literally 60 years ago. They had nothing. They used to go off with their Saluki dogs and falconers and camels. And now they're all living in these ridiculous buildings and building the most crazy projects. This is the Palm Dubai, which is the world's stupidest development. I mean, you could not dream this up, literally. These are all multi-million dollar villas bought up by the Beckhams of this world, supposedly. There's one access road here. Uh, it was built in 2004, entirely built by workers from South Asia. In, uh, not India so much, but Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh. Those guys built this. The Emiratis don't do any labouring work at all. Uh, and straight after it was built, 2010, they had the banking crash. Again, I don't know the first thing about money. I don't know what caused it, but Dubai suddenly went from that to be broke. So Sheikh Khalifa in Abu Dhabi said, don't worry, I'll give you 100 million, here you go. So they had to rename the tower. It's now Sheikh Khalifa Tower, Burj Khalifa. This is the world's tallest building. Um, this building alone uses 250,000 gallons of water a day. Bear in mind this is a desert. There's, they've long since finished their groundwater. So all of that water is desalinated. It makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. There's 40, 34 kilometers of piping just to supply the air conditioning. I mean, the whole thing is completely bonkers. This is a thing called the Dubai World. Having built this crazy Palm Island with its one road access <laughs> and built a wall around it so the ocean can't flush things away. So you have this million dollar villa sitting on a stagnant bit of Persian Gulf <laughs> with sewage floating around. And um, you know, it just 
best belief. But there's even worse. There's this thing called the Dubai World. They were flogging off, these are 300 individual islands built of rock, blown up from the Musandam Mountains. So this is Arabia, you know, there's no shortage of real estate. Why would you blow up your mountains to dump it in an ocean to build a million dollar villa on? It's so ridiculous, you think, this cannot be true. And every time you go to Dubai, there's another crazy story, so it is true. Um, unfortunately, they are destroying their mountains to dump here. And of course, the bed, there's no bedrock in the Persian Gulf, it's all mud sitting on top of tertiary limestone. So all these houses, within two years of completion, are now starting to crack and subside and tilt. So all these Beckhams of this world, well, they can probably afford to just write it off, but there's a lot of people who are now taking Nafi to court, Nafil to court, over this problem. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's crazy. It's completely mad. Destroying mountains to make artificial islands makes no sense whatsoever. All of this is built on reclaimed land. It interrupts the natural water. There's going to be huge problems. Well, there are already with sewage, transport, destroying natural habitats, everything. Clearly, there was no planning. Well, there must have been planning went into this, but whoever did that planning should be hung, drawn, and quartered. Um, absolutely not. Uh, there's all sorts of other problems. Apart from all the environmental problems uh, that I've talked about, there's huge social problems. These I've seen this from the other side of my work, which is in Nepal, and the only source of income in Nepal is sending Nepalis out here to build football stadiums or these crazy sky rise. They, they get treated appallingly badly. It is 21st century slave labor in no other terms. And these are some of the richest countries in the world. It's really quite disturbing. Uh, so when is the bubble going to burst? Well, the oil's not going to run out. In Abu Dhabi, it's got enough for 100 years. In Oman, they're over the hump, so they have more bigger problems together with an increasing population. But Abu Dhabi, Dubai have got so much money, they can't spend it. If they're not buying up central London, they're building skyscrapers out on mud flats in the Persian Gulf. Uh, and it's all rather depressing. Um, so what are the solutions? Well, you don't blow up your mountains for a start. You don't build things like golf courses. If you want to play golf, go to Scotland where it rains every day. Don't go to Arabia. You don't have ski slopes in Dubai. <laughs> this is absolutely bonkers. You need to respect the immigrant labor, pay them a decent wage, and give them the rights that they have everywhere else in the world. There's, there's solutions, but unfortunately, a lot of this is too late. You know, it's too late. The whole of Dubai looks like that. And this, in my view, is a lesson in how not to develop on literally every front. <coughs> Just next door is Oman, which has magnificent coastline, beautiful place. The mountains are great, people are great. It's a wonderful place. Unfortunately, they think, um, oh, we must copy Dubai. So the first thing they do is sell off all their coastal real estate to Sheikh Mohammed and the big bucks in Dubai. Well, this area here, it's just east of Muscat, uh, now looks like this. This was bought up by Sheikh Mohammed with a great plan to build 200 houses, a golf course, of course, three five-star hotels, and of course, reclaimed land. Why do they need to reclaim all this land? There were trucks coming every five minutes through Wadi Mahal when I was there in 2007, taking rocks from the mountains of Sai Hattat and dumping it in the ocean here to make this reclaimed land. Then Dubai went bust, and since 2009, it still looks like that today. So they've kicked all the villages out. It's sitting there, languishing away. Nobody quite knows what they're going to do. Uh, this place, of course, you know, whatever planning went into this, it's mind-boggling how they managed to get away with it. There's one access route through here, which comes through here, Wadi Mai, and uh, every time it rains, the Wadi fills up like this. This is a big Wadi flood that I just happened to be caught up in. It doesn't rain that often in Oman, but when it does rain, 
it really rains and these wadis that is 25 30 foot deep there and rising feet per minute and then in 2007 they had uh, one of the world's strongest tropical cyclones ever on record cyclone gonu hit it actually hit the uh, southeast corner of Oman, but it sideswiped Muscat. And there were winds up to 230 kilometers an hour. 24 inches of rain fell in one day. At least 50 deaths, probably much more than that. And they reckon it was four and a half billion dollars of damage just from that one storm. It actually swept straight through uh, the area where all these Nissan showrooms were. So these have piles and piles of these fancy four-wheel drives, brand new. They were all swept out to sea. They lost a lot, including a lot of people driving them. Uh, it was really quite incredible. And if anyone knows Oman, this is the McDonald's in, uh, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, it's in the middle of Kurram. That's a three-story building. This is the main shopping center around here. Uh, so that's what happens if you suddenly swipe a um, cyclone through the middle of Oman. Well, if your main access route to your golf course is down where you might, you're stuffed. And that road is taken out every year with the slightest bit of rain. So development. Well, I'm not against all development. In fact, clearly you've got to have some. Some of it's done very well. This is an example of a, a resort, three hotels. Bar al Jissa, just to the east of Muscat, which is very nice, pleasant, if you like that sort of thing. This is what it looked like before, which is far nicer. I used to camp on this beach, snork around here, uh, and it's now sort of turned from that into the south of France. Uh, and it's a spectacular coastline. Everywhere you go, it's magnificent. Little beaches, rocky headlands, great. Some absolutely unique uh, cowries, anyone into uh, cowrie collecting there uh, and a lot of this is prime real estate to somebody's come in say oh that's a nice beach I think I'll build a five-star hotel there if you did that it would destroy a lot of stuff including this which is another one of these completely unique sites in the world this is the only place in the world you can see these rocks which are eclogites these are formed at a hundred kilometers depth in a subduction zone. You don't see those normally, they're around the <coughs> edge of the Pacific. Uh, and it's the only place in the world you see that. This is a structural section where these rocks down here at the deepest level. Well, uh, there's been talk about building resorts along the coast here, building a two-lane, uh, sorry, a double four-lane highway from Muscat all the way east, which would basically destroy all of these mountains. Um, and you know, there's plenty of other places along the coast. Just leave this Eclodite beach alone because the best thing you can do with these is just leave it alone. So the main objects of these geoparks is to actually get it into Omani law that this area here is not for development. You don't have to beautify it or put a fence around it or do anything like that. You just need to preserve it, keep it away from the developers. So this is uh, another place. This is the main access road down to that resort, Wadi Yiti. And it happens to have the world's largest sheath fold. I won't go into all the reasons why it is so incredible, but this is, on a scale of 10, this is number 10, the best, biggest sheath fold anywhere on the planet. You get sheath folds all over the place, but never on this scale. And I had a student, uh, Sam, who's sitting right here, he did a fourth year project mapping out this structure and this is his one of his maps three-dimensional maps of this wadi uh, absolutely spectacular now one of the plans for Oman is to build this network of motorways motorways mean development and development must be good one of them is to build a four-lane dual carriageway from Muscat all the way down and this mountain would go the plans were to demolish the whole of this build a four-lane dual carriageway down to, to that golf resource and the 200 houses. Uh, there's plenty of other places you could build it, like five kilometers in either direction, and every time it rains this wadi fills up like a bathtub and destroys the road. So it's a very no-brainer to do not develop, don't put the road down the wadi, put it up in the mountains to the west and the east. 
But trying to get that across to the people, they A, don't know what on earth you're talking about, they don't know what a sheath fold is, why should we preserve, it's just a bit of rock. And uh, then the next breath is they say, but we must develop, our country is poor, we need to develop. Well, there's ways to develop and there's ways not to develop. But there are plans to build the entire coastline of Oman to have developments spreading all the way along. Every year I go back, I look in horror at the latest, latest developments there. Um, some of them, they can't develop. This is the world's second largest cave up in the mountains. Imagine you sell gin. There's a person down there for scale. There's one exiling down. There's another person there. Uh, you can't put a hotel on top of that because it might collapse. It's cast, and cast tends to collapse. So some things are preserved. Uh, CO2 sequestration. Now this is another big problem in Oman, where some people there, there is increasing need that we need to lock up CO2. CO2 is doing an awful lot of damage to this planet, and some people think that one solution could be that you pump CO2 down into these mantled rocks, and there is this reaction. Olivine and pyroxene are the two main minerals that make up the mantle parts per guy. And if you add CO2 and water, you end up making the olivines into serpentine, the same rock you see in the lizard in the UK, and calcite and magnesite. So all these white veins are actually magnesite, magnesium carbonate. So if you manage to somehow pump CO2 down and lock it up into these mantle rocks, there is a potential for capturing CO2 and locking it up in the rock. The problem is we, didn't, we don't know the time scales of that reaction. Is it 100 years? Is it two hours? We just don't know. And Shell is now doing a lot of uh, preliminary work on this project to see A, if it's solvable. If it is solvable, which I sort of doubt, then that would end up, you'd basically have to drill hundreds and hundreds of wells through the aphiolite to pump the CO2 down there. So in that way, you would be destroying a lot of what you're out there to preserve. So there's a big dilemma. Th this is not going to solve the world's CO2 problem. We, you need to do all the other stuff that everyone's been on about for years about climate control. And it's not helped by politics, of course, in the US at the moment that's tearing all those, unbelievably tearing all those things up. Anyway, a few more sites. This is another site. You've all heard of the KT boundary when the meteorite hit. The, these are some of the uh, Maastrichtian mass death assemblages, absolutely spectacularly preserved over Oman. This is our colleague in Abu Dhabi, Mohammed, uh, sitting, standing on the KT boundary, and this is all the death assemblage of the corals and reedus that died out at the end of the Cretaceous. This is a beautifully preserved ocean island, something like Tenerife or Canary Islands, sitting out the ocean uh, on top of the volcanic substrate, now preserved as an intact thrust slice in Oman. Um, this also happens to be one of the best climbing routes in the whole of Arabia. It's a 1,500 metre high cliff. It's almost vertical, and it is absolutely stunning. This is the Eiger North face of Arabia. Uh, this is a route we put up way back in the late 80s up here. That last picture was taken from there, looking across at the final pitch. Uh, so this could be developed into a, another Wadi Rum, well, you know, famous climbing area of Jordan. And it's got these incredible uh, beehive tombs down here. So there's archaeology all over Oman as well. There's permanent waterfalls in Oman, beautiful vegetation, Wadi Bani Khalid. Perennial waterfalls in Arabia, and that's amazing. This is a pretty unknown part of the Eastern Jebel. Sandfalls, spectacular. I was talking about these with Adrian the other day. we done a lot of work on this in UAE. The Wahiba sands, these are some of the world's largest long linear dunes that stretch all the way down to the Indian Ocean. And when you drive, you need a powerful four-wheel drive. You're driving up and down these huge dunes. And then as you hit the south coast, the Indian Ocean, you suddenly crest one of these, and there's the ocean right in front of you. Absolutely spectacular place. 
This is an area of Dukum in the central part of South Omar. And uh, this is now the site of one of these geoparks that the government, finally, they want to do it one by one, which doesn't make an awful lot of sense to me. But anyway, this is the one that they want to develop first because they are building a billion dollar new port at Dukum, which, again, I don't quite see the logic behind that because Dukum is on the monsoon coast of Arabia. Three months of the year, you have 30 foot waves. Sorry. And uh, I don't quite know who's going to use this port. Anyway, these, uh, that's one, one of these geoparks. Another one are all these salt domes. Central Oman has about five or six of these spectacular Precambrian salt domes poking up here in the desert. A lot of these are structural traps for oil fields. Uh, the south coast Oman has little bits of ophiolites on the Indian Ocean here and amazing uh, topography in the tertiary uh, Paleogene rocks down opposite Oman. And then the far southern province in Dofar, which was one that they went to war with with the Yemenis back in the 60s, um, again absolutely spectacular. This is Jebel Sanhan. This is the only Precambrian basement really exposed in Oman. And these mountains in Jebel Sanhan are the home of the Arabian leopard. Absolutely amazing mountains, trekking routes through there. And there's only about two or three hundred of these Arabian leopards left in the world, and they all live in Jebel Samhan and just across the border into Yemen. And some friends of mine took these pictures on remote camera tracks through the mountains, David Willis. Uh, it's a spectacular place, absolutely incredible place. So, and then of course the desert, the Arabian desert, well the whole central part of Oman, the empty quarter, continues off into Saudi Arabia. There's an incredible history about the exploration through there from Philby and Thomas all the way to Thesiger. And Thesiger is without doubt the leading exploration uh, traveler who's traveled all through Oman. Absolutely amazing guy. I had the privilege of meeting him just before he died about 20 years ago in an exploration club dinner here. And uh, he sat down, he was incredibly old and rugged face. He, you know, and uh, he said, did you, he could ba barely speak. He said, did you ever get to climb Jebel Shams? And he said, yes, I've been up it three times. It was wonderful. And he just turned around to me and said, you bastard. <laughs> <laughs> But what a great guy. And his books, I think, are the best travel exploration books ever. Arabian Sands, you can't go to Oman or anywhere without looking at it. Well, Oman still has. A lot of the stuff that Thesiger was on about, they still do. The, these are the camel fairs down in the Sharkia region of eastern Arabia. And every year they have these camel races. This is all for the locals, not, there's no tourists there. <coughs> and uh, you have to know where they are. They, they, there's about four different places at the northern end of the Wahibas when they have these. And when you go there, it's got a fantastic sort of history and culture associated with these. And they have, um, it's just a wonderful place. Okay, um, so the big problem in Oman is that they had, the Sultan is very pro-conservation. He's a very, very good ruler. And one of the first things he did, uh, with good advice from his people around him was to set up the Oryx Reserve. Now this is one of the legendary animals that used to be all over the central deserts of Arabia and they were shot out mostly by Saudis and Kuwaitis who used to have machine guns welded onto the roof of their pickup trucks and just come down and kill everything, gazelles and whatever. So they were pretty much wiped out. Uh, so this is a breeding herd from Phoenix, Arizona that was shipped in at vast expense, courtesy of Shell. And they set up this huge reserve called Yaluni on the Jeddah al Harisis, let them go, and for 10 years they prospered, they bred, and it was absolutely wonderful. And they, all the local Harisis tribes were given ranger status to look after them, and it all worked very, very well. Until some of the poachers came down from Saudi, started killing them, taking them back to private zoos. A lot of the private zoos in Abu Dhabi are poached oryx from Oman. And the other problem was that Shell discovered some big oil and gas fields down in the hookup, so they wanted to do seismic lines across there. 
and instead of what they did was shrink the reserve down by a half, and UNESCO turned around and said, no, you can't do that, that's illegal. If you do that, we're going to delist you. What they should have done was allow Shell to do the seismic. Seismic is just shooting a line. Once it's done, it's done. There's no reason to shrink the reserve down. But anyway, they did shrink it down. UNESCO withdrew World Heritage status, and this was the first, I think the only UNESCO World Heritage site to be delisted. And this was a big deal for Oman. It was not a good thing to do. So trying to now get them through, we want these UNESCO World Heritage Sites in Oman. They say, oh no, we've had our tails burnt by UNESCO, we don't really want that anymore. So anyway, we have to preserve, and uh, with great help from a lot of people who are doing some fantastic work behind the scenes, Omanis and people like Bruce here, uh, we are going ahead to try to do this. And every year we go out to Oman, uh, things are moving in the right direction. But anyway, here's a list of some of the wildlife parks in Oman. The Oryx Reserve, the Wadi Serene, the Arabian Taha is a little goat that lives up in the northern part of Oman, Darmanyat Islands, the Leopard Reserve, and of course the turtle beaches of the Indian Ocean, where most of the green and leatherback turtles breed. Uh, Absolutely incredible bird watching place as well, all over Oman. It's right on the migration route down to Africa. And um, these are just a list of people who have done absolutely fantastic work. Quite a lot of these have died now. Ralph Daly set up the Oryx project with the Sultan. He was personal friends, the Sultan's emissary for wildlife conservation. Mike Gallagher was a bird person. Dave Willis was the leopard person. Hardy and Khalid al Hikmani were local. Bedu, who lived in a farm just below Jebel Samhan. Matteo Willis now works for the BBC, filming Attenborough stuff, and so on. Don and Eloise Bosch, these were the original missionary doctors there when we first went in the 70s. And Don was a great diver, shell collector. And uh, Rod Sam, Robert Baldwin did a coastal survey of the whole of the Gulf. And uh, Hans and Jens, Jens uh, Ericsson, uh, the leading bird watchers. Okay, so there's 50 of these sites scattered around Oman. There's a list of them. They won't mean much to you unless you know the country. Uh, but uh, all of these sites are world-class geological sites, and some need urgent preservation. Some, like Wadi Mai and Sifa, are in urgent need of uh, law saying no development there. Otherwise, they could be gone in a year or two. Um, and there's another whole list of sites of special scientific interest. And the main thing to take home from this is that of all of those 50 areas that I've proposed, and there's probably more, it's less than 5% area of total in Oman. When you look at countries that really, really preserve their national parks to a fantastic degree, Thailand being top of the list, they are looking at 10, 15, 20%. So this is not a very big area. Um, they are of absolute fundamental importance for science and research in the future. Education is absolutely critical to all of this. They're of economic benefit to Oman. When Oman runs out of oil, which it will do, um, there's nothing else there. There's fish, dates, and oil. And fish and dates aren't really going to do much. Uh, but they could become a world-class tourist, geotourist conservation area here there. Phenomenal scenery, incredible beaches, scuba diving, everything, climbing, caving, everything. Uh, development in the wrong place destroys the heritage forever. Once it's gone, once you've built that palace on top of my dikes in the UAE, it's gone forever, unless you blow the palace up. And who benefits? The Omanis certainly don't benefit. Sheikh Mohammed benefits, he's got another palace to add to his 50 that he's already got and um, the developers and the bankers probably develop, but the local people don't. With my geoparks, the local people will be hired as rangers, conservationists, people to show tourists around. So there's an economic benefit to the country. And most of all, it's the developers need to talk to the geologists, because they quite often go in there and say, oh, we didn't know that was even there. So those are the sort of problems we face. Uh, but is a, Oman is a fantastic country. It's unique in Arabia, um, and 
they do have very, very special sites to conserve. And once you've got a head around the politics and the money and the development business, uh, it's basically just a good thing to do. We, we have to preserve our heritage, otherwise the whole world will end up looking like Dubai. And God forbid that ever happens. Thank you.